Well, good evening, and thank you for being with us tonight as we commence the second lecture of the W. David Baer Distinguished Lecture Series in the 2022-2023 academic year. If we have not met previously, my name is Michael Feltner, and I have the honor of serving as the Dean of Seaver College. And we are especially privileged to have with us this evening a scholar, Dr. Teresa Bejan, who has expertise in a subject that is solely missing in many segments of our society, civility. As she states in the opening paragraph of her book, M Mere Civility, the crisis of civility affecting our own modern society suggests that what we say to each other, as well as how we say it, is a matter of profound importance. But it also, but it also holds out the hope of reasonably straightforward solutions. Civility will do the work of harmonizing our differences so that we might disregard one another despite our fundamental disagreements, not as enemies, but friends. And what could be more important in our democratic republic or in a university than the ability, the ability to engage in robust debate or the free exchange of ideas vigorously but also respectfully? Teresa, thank you for joining us at Pepperdine this evening. I look forward with both anticipation and hope to your remarks on this relevant and very important topic. As we begin this evening's program, I want to thank our Provost Jay Brewster, our Chancellor Sarah Jackson, and most importantly, each of you for joining us this evening. We're blessed by your presence and it is heartwarming to see a very full auditorium. I also want to share a few words about our format for the evening. Following our speaker's address, we will take a brief two to three minute recess to excuse students who have an evening class beginning at 6 p.m. Students, if you do not have an evening class or it begins later than 6 p.m., please extend to our speaker and the other guests the courtesy of remaining in your seats through the question and answer session. Following the brief recess, we will proceed immediately to a Q&A with Dr. Bejan. During the Q&A, we will have staff roving throughout the auditorium with microphones, and I ask that you wait until you receive a microphone before asking your question. Before asking your question, also please identify yourself. I'd now like to ask for Professor of Philosophy, Dr. Garrett Pendergraft, to come forward and please introduce our honored guest. Garrett. Good evening. As Dean Feltner mentioned, I have the privilege of introducing our distinguished lecturer this evening. Um, professor Teresa Bejan uh, is professor of political theory uh, and a fellow of Oriel College at the University of Oxford. Uh, prior to arriving at Oxford, she had positions also at University of Toronto and Columbia University. Professor Bejan is an influential scholar. Uh, she's been awarded numerous prizes and fellowships in political philosophy and political thought more generally. Uh, most recently, she was awarded the Philip Leverhulme Prize in Politics, which celebrates early career researchers who have already accomplished significant um, achievements, uh, international recognition, and who also show exceptional promise for the future. Uh, in her research, Professor Bejan examines uh, a wide range of historical perspectives, ranging from ancient Greece to the 20th century, uh, and she shows how these perspectives can be applied to contemporary questions in political philosophy, uh, in political theory. Uh, she's written extensively on various themes, including free speech, civility, toleration, and equality. Um, as, as you know, she's published a book entitled Mere Civility. You heard a bit from it. Um, and so that, uh, that book examines uh, calls for civility in the 17th century, um, uh, examines contemporary calls for civility in light of 17th century debates about uh, religious toleration. Uh, Professor Bejan is also working on another book uh, tentatively entitled First Among Equals, and that's gonna be exploring the fascinating but forgotten history of equality uh, prior to modern egalitarianism. And that's scheduled out with Harvard University Press later this year. In addition to her extensive scholarship, Professor Bejan also writes for popular venues such as The Atlantic, uh, The New York Times, The Washington Post. Uh, her TED Talk from 2018, Is Civility a Sham? Uh, has received uh, over 1.7 million views. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bejan. 
Uh, well, thank you very much for that kind and double introduction. I feel very, very welcome, very honored to be here and really just thrilled to see so many people here in the audience. I hope that it's worth your while. Um, I didn't know that civility sold so well, but here we go. Um, so yeah, it's an honor to be here today uh, to talk to you about civility or rather what I call mere civility and what it has to do with tolerance and the limits uh, thereof. So in my remarks, I'm gonna focus on one question in particular, and that question is this. What precisely is the role of civility in a tolerant society? And do we need more of it, or do we need less? Now, as my distinguished introducers mentioned, I'm here to talk to you today as an expert of sorts on civility, but I must say that's a really dubious distinction. Because the book I'm here to talk to you about was published first in 2017, it was republished in 2019, and as you can see, everything's going really well. <laughs> I solved it, great. Um, actually, what, uh, what I will say is, as an expert, I can say definitively that there are few perennials in American politics, or indeed on college campuses, like the crisis of civility. Um, over the past three decades, this crisis has become a permanent affliction, not only in the United States, but in other liberal democratic societies. And when I say liberal democratic societies, I, I mean primarily societies that aspire to be tolerant, as well as open, as well as free. These are societies that regard themselves as tolerant societies. And so in the US or in the UK, where I live now, whenever the national conversation gets heated, the calls for civility begin. And those calls are met increasingly quickly by eye rolls from the civility skeptics, who I think are rightly suspicious that very often the self-appointed guardians of civil discourse might be a little bit more concerned with uh, silencing their opponents than they are with actually having a, a robust disagreement or debate. So, you know, so far so familiar. Maybe the eyes roll a little faster now that we've had so much practice. Um, and who can blame the skeptics, really? Despite much evidence to the contrary, civility's boosters, in the book I call them civilitarians, um, civilitarians continue to insist that conversational virtue is the panacea for all that ails us. But the skeptics rightly note that as a solution to the problems facing deeply divided, deeply divided societies like our own, Civility seems inadequate at best as a solution, or at least it could be even counterproductive, we might think. I mean, why should we think that talking to each other at length about the questions that divide us most deeply is a good idea, let alone that it's gonna bring us closer together, right? Surely the tolerant thing to do, insofar as we want to live in a tolerant society, the tolerant thing to do would be to agree to disagree, to accept our differences and move on. And on that view, I think it's one I associate in the book with Thomas Hobbes, that view says that well, what we really need is not civil disagreement, we need civil silence, right? We just need to not say what we think when it comes to the questions that matter most. And if our differences are so deep, so very fundamental that we simply can't move on or move past them, well, it seems on this view that really we've just got to learn to live with incivility and accept that civil disagreement just simply isn't on the cards. One of the most striking developments since I published the book in 2017 is the emergence uh, of, a, of a third option, and I think maybe it's an increasingly prevalent option, to more and more people today and to many young people especially, it seems like civility is not only not the solution to what ails us, but actually civility is a kind of apology for our problems, or we can put it in a slightly different way. Many people, I think, are wary of civility as itself a kind of fig leaf for intolerance. So I think that the, the worry here is that, uh, you know, there's a downside and maybe even a dark side to civility. People worry that in the face of hatred or injustice, good manners are simply tantamount to complicity. I'm sure you've heard this. Critics on all sides of the political spectrum, left and right, therefore will argue that civility isn't a virtue at all. Indeed, it's a vice. One that both demands deference to elites, or at least those who are privileged by the status quo, and then delegitimizes dissent and marginalizes those who are already marginal. 
And so perhaps here I'll make a confession that when I set out to write this book many years ago now, uh, I began working on civility and tolerance because I was a skeptic or maybe even a critic. I was really in touch with the dark side of civility. And I was pretty convinced that the abundance of civility talk in American politics for decades by that point, and it's only, you know, it's only increased, a lot of that civility talk was just a sham. Or as I put it in my te te talk, TED talk, I used a curse word, but I'm not gonna use it here because I <laughs> respect, <laughs> respect my context. Um, but again, today, I think we're witnessing more than skepticism. We're, we're witnessing a kind of widespread disillusionment with civility, a sense that the time for civil disagreement is over. It's now the time for righteous outrage, public shaming, and even calling out of our opponents. And on this view, what a tolerant society needs is not more civility, it needs incivility, and a culture clearer than ever before on what it will not tolerate. This explains the revival uh, in the 21st century of an uh, argument first made by the 20th century philosopher of science, Karl Popper. So Popper described what he called the paradox of tolerance. Now you may have seen this memed. I think it's been memed like many arguments from 20th century philosophy of science, uh, if you're on Twitter. So but what Popper said was this, quote, if we extend unlimited tolerance even to those who are intolerant, then the tolerant will be destroyed in tolerance with them. We should therefore claim said Popper, in the name of tolerance, the right not to tolerate the intolerant. You may be familiar with this. Now, a critic of civility would add to Popper's paradox that we should not be civil towards those we deem intolerant either. And now here, this might count as a spoiler alert, but I think it's probably helpful, that I disagree with Popper, <laughs> okay? I think that one can and should absolutely be civil to the intolerant. One reason for that is simply, I think it's very difficult often to determine with any degree of certainty who the intolerant one is in any given situation. But secondly, uh, I'll just say it's because I am, from my early days of civility skepticism, now convinced that civility is a virtue, or at least what I call mere civility is a virtue, or, in, or at least it's not a vice, and we could do with more of it rather than less, or in, at least that's what I hope to convince you of today. Anyway, given the sort of controversies I've mentioned, given uh, recent events, I do think it's fair to be frustrated with civility and its place in a tolerant society. But as a political theorist, one of the things that struck me most and continues to strike me now when I look at sort of contemporary discourse about civility on college campuses and elsewhere, is just how rarely people bother to define what they mean by civility. They sort of fling this word around, they say, oh, we need more civility. No, 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 civility is an apology for, for hatred and it's a civilizing discourse. Nobody bothers to define their terms, but of course you are all well taught here at Pepperdine. Surely you define your terms. So I'm gonna define mine, okay? I wanna start today by saying a bit about what I take civility to be, how we might understand it in contrast with other conversational virtues. And then I'm gonna turn to the history of civility, and specifically to debates about religious toleration in early modern Europe, which I argue in the book are really the source of civility as a kind of key virtue in a tolerant society, the source of that idea that I think that we are wrestling with today. And then finally, I'm going to introduce you to one early modern civilitarian in particular, one who I think came up with a really, really profound understanding of what civility is and also what it is not in a tolerant society. And of course, you all know who I mean. It's Roger Williams, the founder of Rhode Island. It's everyone's favorite 17th century colonial founder. You all, you all know, you're nodding, you know. So I'm gonna introduce you to Roger Williams and uh, his theory of mere civility from which I take the title of my book and uh, which provides the title of my talk today. And I'm, gonna, and I'm gonna argue that the virtue we need more of is mere civility and that the mere and that really matters. Okay, so let's begin at the beginning. What is civility? I mean, for many people, I think the answer seems obvious, right? Well, civility is just, you know, like, look, it's like a synonym. It's a synonym for politeness, for good manners, for courtesy, maybe. You know, it's an old-fashioned synonym, but we know what it means, right? I think if, if that were right, if that were actually the essence of civility, then I think it would indeed be a thin branch to hang our democratic hopes on, if you will. 
Um, but if you go to the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, you'll see that defining civility gets really complicated really quickly. So that definition that we maybe think is most intuitive, that idea of civility as a kind of synonym for courtesy or good manners, that's offered as the 12th definition of civility when you consult the OED, right? So that, that's a good indicator that maybe this is, a, this is a word with a history, and it's one of those words that carries its history with it. If we want to be more precise, I think we might say that civility is a conversational virtue, right, akin to politeness, to courtesy, to respect, but one that is nonetheless distinguished by several peculiar features. Okay, so what are those features? Well, firstly, maybe I should say, by conversational virtue, I simply mean that civility is a virtuous disposition, or rather a standard of excellent behavior. We think that someone who has this virtue is somehow excellent, we look up to them. So civility is virtue that governs how people speak to each other, both in the substance of what they say, but also the manner in which they say it. But right away, we can see that civility, unlike politeness or respect or courtesy, is meant to govern one kind of conversation in particular, namely disagreement. Right? Civility isn't just about how we speak, it's about how we disagree. As Thomas Hobbes, my favorite 17th century philosopher, pointed out, so Williams is a colonial founder, he's not a philosopher, Hobbes is the philosopher, okay. Hobbes pointed out there's a reason that the word disagreeable is a synonym for unpleasant, okay? As he put it in 1642, and I quote, the mere act of disagreement is offensive. Not to agree with someone is, on an issue is tacitly to accuse him of error, just as to dissent from him in a large number of points is tantamount to calling him a fool. So Hobbes' point here, and I think it's really profound, is that there's an element of insult implicit in disagreement, because when I disagree with you, I'm suggesting that you've, at best, reasoned incorrectly. But at worst, I may be suggesting that, I don't know, you're kind of dumb, you're crazy, or even worse, you're a little bit biased, a little bit bigoted, maybe you're self-interested, right? So we have theories that explain why people disagree with us. Because if there weren't some, you know, if they weren't sort of somehow blinded, surely they would see that I'm right, okay? But so that disagreeableness of disagreement, I think, is really important. And then if we understand that disagreement is disagreeable, we can see the virtue of civility as an attempt to respond to or to mitigate that disagreeableness that's inherent, intrinsic to disagreement, okay? But if disagreement itself is difficult, it seems that civility is particularly crucial to a certain kind of disagreement, and it's what I call in the book fundamental disagreement, right? So fundamental disagreements on my view are disagreements about issues that we regard as fundamental or foundational to our worldviews and to our identities. So I think maybe you know the kinds of disagreements. I mean, historically, disagreements about religion, Increasingly, disagreements about politics. Now, disagreements about the politics of popular culture. Can't have those at the dinner table. But right, through these disagreements where we define ourselves as well as our opponents in the controversy. Whose side are you on? Those kinds of disagreements. Okay? So I think that civility is particularly crucial in the context of fundamental disagreements. And these disagreements about believing and belonging I think is John Haidt who's spoken to you. I think that's how John would put it. They're sort of believing and belonging disagreements. They feel particularly fraught. But civility holds out the hope that we can have these fundamental disagreements and that they might even be productive so long as we have them in the right way, that is, with civility. Okay, so this brings me to the second, I think, peculiar feature of, dis of, of civility as opposed to other conversational virtues, which has to do with its negative, or at least minimal, overtones, right? The sense of civility is not like politeness or respect because it, it indicates a kind of low bar grudgingly met. When we call for more civility from our opponents, we're generally, we generally have something less than respect in mind. Civility feels like the virtue most at home between ex-spouses or bad neighbors or members of the other party. And so this is what I mean by mere civility has that kind of minimalness. Actually, the word mere in early modern English means pure, as well as kind of minimal. But I think that, that the, those dual senses of mereness are important to the work that we want civility to do. And that brings me to the third feature of civility, 
So consider its many cognates in modern English. We have words like civic, civilian, civilization, citizen. All of these words, like civility itself, actually derive from Latin. And they derive from the Latin word civitas, meaning the body of citizens or the state. Now, that derivation suggests that civil disagreements are not just disagreements between anyone. They're disagreements between people who stand in a particular kind of relation to one another. We might say that they share a civil society. And now what's distinctive about civil society on my view is not that it's civil, it's that it's a kind of society that is unchosen. So civil disagreements are ones that we have with people that we're stuck with, the people we did not choose. And on that view, you can see that civil disagreement might be important in a family. You didn't choose your family. But it's also going to be important in your state. They're the people with whom you are forced to share a life, even if you don't share a faith. And given that, I think we can begin to see just why civility might be particularly important in tolerant societies, societies that don't require their members to share a faith. OK. So, <clears throat> The close connection between civility and tolerance conceptually, I think, is borne out by a close connection between these ideas historically. Okay? So debates about civility were always about attempting to kind of draw the line around our civil society to say who was in and who was out. Right? To say that someone is uncivil, it's worse than calling them impolite. It's worse than saying they're rude. It's a way of saying, they're beyond the pale, OK? And now the phrase beyond the pale is itself interesting, right? Because the word pale in English, again, derives from Latin. Look, I could go all day and just tell you the Latin derivations of words, but I swear that this one's important. Pale, in this case, comes from the idea of the palace or the stake. So the pale is a fence. So most famously, the pale was the fence around the city of Dublin, which kept the uh, civilized Anglo-Protestants safe from the savage Irish Catholics beyond, right? But so when you use the phrase beyond the pale, you're using a phrase that carries this legacy of exclusion. So the worry that critics of civility have, that when we appeal to civility, we're always kind of drawing a line between those who are in and those who are out, those who can be included and those who must be suppressed, right? And I want to argue that that element of exclusion is intrinsic to civility talk. So civility is always what we might call in the business part of a civilizing discourse. But a central argument in my book is that not all civilizing discourses are created equal, right? Some civilizing discourses are really essential if we want to have the kind of community that allows for tolerance, freedom, and indeed disagreement. And so the question, the crucial question becomes, how are you defining civility? Whom are you proposing to exclude when you are appealing to this virtue, right? I propose we look directly at that element of exclusion instead of kind of waving it aside. Okay. So the conceptual complexity of civility I've outlined thus far, I think is a fitting reflection of its complex history. So some historians, when they talk about the history of civility, they'll focus on that kind of Latin origin. They'll say, like, look, civility has to do with citizenship. It's a virtue of public spiritedness, political friendship, these kinds of things. Critics of civility will say, no, civility was always just a synonym for civilization, and it was a pretext for empire, for colonialism, and for the suppression of the peoples of the new world, among others. Right? As ever, I want to say, well, it's a little bit of both. But actually, what we should do if we want to understand civility is look to the, seven, the 16th and 17th centuries in particular and look at the work that civility is doing in debates about religious toleration. Okay? Arguably, the first modern crisis of civility was kicked off by none other than Martin Luther. Luther had made himself a master of a new communications technology, namely the printing press. Now, when I pointed this out in 20, 2017, it was cool and original. Now it's sort of a kind of trope. But like, think of the printing press like Twitter, OK? But like more, disrupt, more disruptive than Twitter, OK? So what Luther does on Twitter 
is call people names. He's really good at it, right? So when the Pope calls Luther's 95 Theses heretical, Luther responds, as one does, by calling the Pope the Antichrist. That's what you do on Twitter. So in 1531, Luther announces himself, quote, unable to pray without at the same time cursing. If I say, hallowed be thy name, I must add, cursed, damned, and outraged be the name of the papists who slander your name. Okay, so the good long-standing Protestant tradition of calling Catholics papists and anti-Christians started here, right? And the Catholics gave as good as they got. They had traditional labels like heretic, but they also had other new insults, like the label Protestant started out as an insult. And indeed, when the Pope excommunicates Luther, he denominates, that is names, all of Luther's followers, followers Lutherans as an insult, right? Followers of this absolute troll. Okay. So critics of Luther, like Erasmus, accuse him of lowering the conversational tenor, violating the standard of civility. Luther says, look, the truth is always going to be offensive to those privileged by the status quo. Luther says, and I quote, you can't turn the sword into a feather, and the word of God is a sword. So many of the Protestants who follow in Luther's wake take his words to heart. A particularly stri striking example is that of the Quakers in 17th century England. So if you're more familiar with today's pacifist society of friends, let me introduce you to the early Quakers. They're really good at doing things like going naked for a sign in public, banging pots and pans to interrupt other people's church services. My favorite is the Quaker man who lies naked on the communion table, to make a point. Um, but anyway, what the, what, the, what the Quakers are doing is putting this evangelical incivility into practice. It's the idea that the religious truth, Christian righteousness, is going to be and has got to be offensive, right? That's what makes it true. So you've got to shock, you've got to offend, right? To sort of shake people out of their complicity in this corrupt status quo, okay? This leads to a, a, a quite... Uh, principled, conscientious opposition to civility. Civility, Quakers will argue, is simply a synonym for hypocrisy. There's one really great quote, it's not a Quaker, but it's another dissenter. Civility doth but wash the outside, but the inwards must be washed. A pig may be washed, yet a pig still. Right. Uh, or the civil person, and I quote, hath a secret antipathy to the ways of God. Okay. So if you're civil, you're doing it wrong. You're sort of, again, you're, you're becoming complicit in an unjust status quo. And on this view, people who complain about civility or call for civil disagreement, all they really want to do is persecute the righteous. Cracking down on incivility is just another way of cracking down on dissent. Today, we tend to think of religious toleration as the obvious response to the very deep differences and disagreements that, that cropped up in European societies after the Protestant Reformation. But part of what I want to do in the book is just point out how not obvious that response was, <laughs> okay? So if you're sort of looking at all of these deep religious div divisions, if you're looking at these uncivil disagreements that are leading to violence, your response is not going to be, hey, let's tolerate this. Your response is going to be like, oh, right, a tolerant society cannot be a civil society. If we want civility, we've got to crack down on dissent. So really, I think the debate becomes kind of bipolar between people who say conscientious incivility is the way forward and civility is just a form of persecution, and those who say, yeah, civility is a form of persecution. Shut up. Go away, right? So in this sort of impasse between, uh, between um, critics of civility and critics of toleration, strides one great man. Okay, maybe that's a bit crude. But anyway, so this is the debate in which I sort of see Roger Williams is intervening and offering, offering a really unexpected move. And the move is this, okay? He says, look, we need to tolerate religious difference. We need to tolerate religious disagreement. And the key to doing that is civility. But it's civility properly understood as what I call mere civility. Okay, so... What does that look like? Well, before I get into what that looks like, maybe I have to go into the biography a little first, because I don't think you can make sense of what Williams was up to unless you get a sense of who he was as a person. Like most Puritans, 
Roger Williams left England in the 1630s, not simply because he'd had enough of being persecuted himself as a dissenter. He left because he really wanted to see what it would be like to leave behind the society of sinners he knew and live in a society of saints. And where was the society of saints, you ask? Well, it was Boston. <laughs> a perfectly just, virtuous city on a hill in which the righteous could live together with the like-minded as models of Christian charity, apart from and indeed above the damned. So is anyone here from Boston? Right, he was right, you know, it's exactly like that. No, okay. Even before he arrived, I think William sort of got the picture that maybe things weren't all he thought that they would be when he left, uh, when he left England. He realized, as he argued, that the unchristian Christians of New England, as he called them, were hypocrites. Hypocrites who were ostentatiously condemning and crying out against the sins of others, while nevertheless living on land that they had stolen from the Native Americans. Now you may think that was a kind of argument that wasn't made until the 20th century. Au contraire. The first intolerable opinion that Williams expresses when he arrives in Massachusetts Bay is this idea that the expropriation of the Americans has been a pious fraud, okay? That wasn't his only offensive opinion. In addition to floating the suggestion that women should wear veils in public, he preached against the sinfulness of swearing civil oaths, and apparently some of his followers were caught defacing an English flag and cutting out the cross of St. George in the middle of it, because William argued that this was a violation of what he called the wall of separation between church and state. So if you're interested in William's influence and kind of American political thought thereafter, it's really this phrase, a wall of separation, which, which is quoted by Jefferson and becomes very important for the writing of the Constitution and then the um, first 10 amendments. Okay, so uh, Williams thinks there needs to be a wall of separation. That's not really kosher in Massachusetts Bay at the time. But the, thing, the point I wanna make about Williams is that he was seen by his fellow Puritans as being too Puritan. <laughs> For them, and indeed too intolerant of other people's errors, right? And ultimately what happens is that Williams first sort of voluntarily exiles himself. He moves from Boston to Salem, later famous for its witch trials, because he sees it as more congenial theologically. Um, but also, he can't stop saying what he thinks telling his fellow New Englanders what he thinks about their unchristian Christianity. And unsurprisingly, like Luther, those on the receiving end, well, they felt that Williams was a little bit uncivil, right? Why can't he just shut up? And eventually they take the extraordinary step of banishing him. And this leads to a famous story where Williams is banished at the height of a New England winter and finds shelter with the local American tribes and then including finally the Narragansett. Okay, but even Williams was able to admit that his expulsion from the Massachusetts Bay Colony had had something to do with what he called his constant admonishing of them in their unclean walking, okay, right? But like Luther, Williams was what we might think of as a virtuoso of hate speech. He's just really good at deploying these very insulting labels. He never called Catholics Catholics. He always called them insulting names like anti-Christians or papists. But nevertheless, Williams thought that we should tolerate anti-Christians and papists, okay? Similarly, although he becomes a very important advocate of the Native American tribes, he's also very clear that he regards their customs as barbarous. He thinks that they're engaged in devil worship. Nevertheless, he goes to the English parliament to plead for toleration of Native American devil worship in the 1650s, right? So in Williams, we get this disconnect, right? What seems he, sound, he is very theologically intolerant and he's not very civil about how he talks about it. Nevertheless, he's committed to the idea that we've got to tolerate all of these people that we know to be damned, okay? So how does he come to this view? I think one reason is that when he finds shelter with a Narragansett after his expulsion, he sort of realizes, he, put, he quote, puts it like this, quote, one must go out of the world entirely if one would not keep converse with idolaters, <laughs> right? So it's just the human condition is one of thrownness into the wilderness, 
And being thrown with other people means that you're going to be thrown amongst those who are wrong with respect to religion. Okay, so he just takes it as fundamentally true that when you cannot choose those with whom you live, you will be living with people you regard as damned. Okay, but if that's right, how are we going to respond to living with those with whom we do not share a faith? Okay, well, Williams' response was toleration. Why did he choose toleration? Well, you might say, well, he wasn't really in a position to choose otherwise. <laughs> But what happens is that Williams ends up founding a town called Providence and indeed founding his own colony that comes to be known as Rhode Island. But maybe it's a little bit too strong to call what he did founding, because that sort of implies a kind of directionality that he knew what he was doing. I think we can think of Rhode Island as being founded accidentally. Okay? And what happens is William sort of starts his own safe haven, and he begins to be followed by people who are just as or even more obnoxious than he is. People like Anne Hutchinson or Samuel Gorton. People are being expelled from the other colonies of New England and finding safe haven in Williams's plantation, as he calls it. That's not like a plantation in the South. A plantation is just an early modern word for colony, okay? So they find solace in uh, Mr. Williams' plantation, much to Mr. Williams' chagrin, it has got to be said. But Williams sort of learns from this experience that, look, he says, quote, that ourselves and all men are apt and prone to differ that either part or party is most right in his own eyes, his cause right, his carriage right, his arguments right, his answers right. This is no new thing in all the former ages or in all the parts of the world. Basically, he starts from this idea that everybody is righteous in his own eyes. And once you realize that, that there's this kind of inevitable partiality in the standard of righteousness, you've got to work out rules and principles on the basis of which everyone who regards themselves as righteous can nevertheless continue to coexist. That's the key thought, right? So of righteousness, the same thing is true of civility. Everyone is an exemplar of civility in his or her own eyes. When I say do stop being uncivil, I mean can't you talk a bit more like me? So Williams is really attuned to the ways in which civility, righteousness, these standards become ways of trying to enshrine or encode our own very partial judgments of what's right and what's required. And of course, on top of this, Williams, as a good Protestant, also has this sense that, look, the truth will be and should be offensive to those who are in error. He just starts that place. He's you know, this idea that you would eliminate offense. If you eliminate offense, you have no hope of getting anywhere near the truth. All you'll do is flatter what people happen to think at the time. But Williams's response, you might say, well, why didn't he go the Quaker direction? Why didn't he then just reject civility as a kind of uh, art, a tool of power and instruments for silencing, suppressing, and excluding? Well, I think that Williams saw that there was something precious, nonetheless, in mere civility. So when we're merely civil to each other, we're allowing each other he put it this way, we're allowing each other the space to breathe in, in the midst of our errors, right? He uses the, uh, the metaphor of the ship at sea, and he's a man, he made five Atlantic crossing in his lifetime, I mean, it's crazy, right? Five Atlantic crossings, but you get that sense of, you know, we allow people the space in the air to breathe in because otherwise we're pushing them overboard, right? We're stuck, we're stuck together, Nevertheless, we've got to make the most of it. And this sense of stuckness leads to a truly extraordinary institutional and political order in Rhode Island. In Rhode Island, you get a state that, uh, you get a colony without an established church, which is really radical in the 17th century. But on top of that, you get a system of what we might call equal liberty. The idea that everyone in Rhode Island, regardless of their religious affiliation, is going to enjoy the same equal rights. Rights to worship, to associate, but also to proselytize. That is, freedom of speech. Everyone is going to have the right to offend everybody else <laughs> and try to win them over to their doctrine. 
And then the final most radical thing, when you think about, wow, a system of equal liberty in the 17th century, Williams is also at the same time arguing for a totally unprecedented, unprecedented range or inclusiveness of religious toleration. He's not just suggesting that Protestants of all stripes should be allowed to freely worship and proselytize in Rhode Island. He's saying Jews, Muslims, Catholics, I mean, Kel Harer, but also atheists in some moods. Maybe that's more controversial. Some of the early modernists can push me on that in the Q&A. <laughs> but in any case, the extent of Williams's toleration goes far, far beyond that of John Locke's, who, for instance, is more famous as a proponent of religious toleration in the late 17th century. OK? Now, when I hold up Williams as a model, I want us to regard him and his colony warts and all. Observers at the time regarded Rhode Island as maybe not a happy, cl ca clappy community of difference that everyone should aspire to. A tolerant society didn't look so good when it looked like Roger Williams. Neighbors called it the latrine of New England, i.e. the sewer. That's where all of the cast-offs, castaways from the other colonies ended up. One person complains that it became a, quote, receptacle for all sorts of riffraff. I don't know. Riffraff. <laughs> I have time for riffraff. But in any case, it's not, I think we've got to be really clear that when we look at Rhode Island, which is the most tolerant society going in the 17th century, it doesn't look like maybe what we would want a tolerant society to look like. And certainly it doesn't look like a civil society in the way that many proponents of civility like to think of today. But I think that it's a society that really exemplified civility, the, the virtue I call mere civility as allowing for the space for deep difference and the, the uh, commitment to ongoing engagement with and indeed disagreement with the people we regard as fundamentally in error. Williams' grounds for doing this were evangelical. He wanted to convert people. And you can't convert them if you keep on kicking them out. Right? But he allowed the same freedom to his opponents. It became a system of basically people trying to convert one another all the time. Counterintuitive, yes, but I think really intriguing. There was only one group that tested the limits of Roger Williams' toleration. I'm sure you'll know who I mean, the Quakers. OK, what was wrong with Quakers? Well, Williams thought they were intolerant. That may sound a little bit strange, right? Quakers will be at this time persecuted in Massachusetts Bay. Pretty soon they're going to found a tolerant society of their own in Pennsylvania. But Williams worried very deeply about one Quaker habit in particular. It was their habit of falling into silent prayer. Williams thought this was a way of shutting down debate, <laughs> precisely when he had the better argument. So he said their silence is a kind of cutting off, which is a euphemism for killing. Their silence is a kind of cutting off of others. Now, if Williams were a pauperian, he would have then said, well, we cannot tolerate the Quakers. They're intolerant. But he wasn't a pauperian, right? He was a merely civilitarian, if you will. So his response was, of course, to challenge three leading Quakers to a debate which he had over three days, really near the end of his life. He's so ill, he has to be carried into the venue on his sickbed. And he just argues with them <laughs> for three days straight and then publishes the, uh, the, the, his account of his very good arguments, right? Um, so I think that model of radical inclusion is a really interesting one because Williams is always in touch with the idea that a tolerant society, if it's gonna be a genuinely inclusive society, will always be a really uncomfortable place to be. Right? We go back to that idea of the disagreeableness of disagreement. You know, It's not a place where we feel comfortable. It's not a place where we flatter each other's intuitions. It's not a place where we say, oh, you're so clever. You're so right. But it is a place where we do each other the honor of really disagreeing and continuing to engage across those disagreements. OK. So taking a step back now, what can we learn from the latrine of New England and what its rather controversial founder got up to? 
I mean, one thing we might learn, and what I argue in the book is, look, forget the founding. If you want to understand why the United States has such a peculiarly permissive approach to the freedom of speech, I call it free speech fundamentalism, you've got to look to these early modern evangelicals like Williams. That's where we get this idea that freedom of speech is basically an emanation of freedom of conscience. I've got to be free to speak my mind. That is not the case in European societies, or indeed, you know, if we look at the UK, the culture around free speech in America is really peculiar, and I think it's this evangelical culture, okay? But secondly, <clears throat> I would say that Williams' life and work really falsifies the Popperian idea of the paradox of tolerance, the idea that you cannot tolerate the intolerant. Williams said, yes, we can, and we must, right? The point of a tolerant society is to tolerate the intolerant. And as Williams knew from experience, a tolerant society cannot pick and choose its materials and stay tolerant. If you're in the business of sort of including and excluding on the basis of whether someone adheres to your commitments, you'll, you're, you're no longer a tolerant society. You're an intolerant one. Mere civility then ends up operating as a kind of tool of uncomfortable inclusion in the midst of diversity, right? And I think, you know, we tend to praise inclusion today as, a, as just an obvious good, but I think we lose sight of its uncomfortableness, okay? Inclusion is hard. It's hard work and it's ongoing work, right? And disagreement is going to remain disagreeable for most people. You know, I'm not a Roger Williams. I, I feel insulted when people disagree. So in the Q&A, just be aware, I'll be really insulted if you disagree with me. But in any case, Williams thought that a tolerant and inclusive society would always be grounded fundamentally in what was a really unreasonable faith, which is that we could coexist in the midst of all these differences. It's never, you know, Rhode Island is never the society that you would design in theory. It's only a society that you could develop in practice and see, oh wait, this actually works, <laughs> right? Locke, for instance, I think, comes up with a much more constrained vision of what a tolerant society should look like precisely because he didn't live in one. He didn't see it work. And I would also go even farther. I think that our own tolerant society has a lot to learn from Roger Williams and his experiment, precisely because I think it challenges our assumptions about what a tolerant or a civil society should look like in the first place. Right? For those of us who are tempted, especially like the early Quakers, to turn our backs on civility, I think that Williams can help us sort of think twice. We can be attuned to the way in which civility talk operates as a kind of strategy for suppressing and excluding, point out how an appeal to civility is often a way of silencing debate, but nevertheless say that is an abuse of civility. Civility, the virtue, is precisely the virtue that keeps the debate ongoing, that doesn't silence us, that instead encourages us to speak up. To speak up, to speak out, and also call out others when we believe them to be in error. To have the courage of expressing that disagreement to them, that is, to their faces and not behind their backs, or indeed, what I think is the more popular strategy these days, of pointing out all the ways in which other people are wrong to our friends who agree with us, okay? That isn't a strategy for inclusion, my friends. That is a strategy for exclusion and the cultivated, cultivation of like-minded, homogenous communities. That is an effort to recreate, dare I say it, the society of saints apart from the society of sinners, right? Mere civility on Williams's model is not an obstacle to calling out injustice. But I also think it does remind us that civility and justice are not the same thing, right? And a civil society will not necessarily be a just society. But I think Williams saw it, and I agree, that what civility holds out the hope for is that we can work together with the people with whom we deeply disagree to make our society more just. You know, so it's a, let's say, it's a collaborative strategy in the pursuit of justice as opposed to an exclusionary strategy in the pursuit of justice. I can maybe unpack that a bit more in the Q&A. Finally, what does civility demand of us? 
Well, it demands first and foremost, mere civility, that we tolerate the disagree disagreeableness of disagreement, that we keep on having disagreements, and that we just get used to the negative effect that they may have on us. Because the more disagreements we have, they'll remain disagreeable, but they'll feel a whole heck of a lot less threatening. Right? We'll have a stronger sense of our identities as having been tested and forged in debate. And finally, I think if you're appealing to civility as a way not to have a disagreement, to avoid a contentious debate, I think you're doing civility wrong. I think Williams would say you're doing civility wrong. But conversely, if you're tempted to valorize incivility, to say civility is a vice, incivility is a virtue, I think mere civility would simply remind you that it's rarely the powerful or the privileged few whose voices will be drowned out in the din of debate. The people who get drowned out in the midst of an uncivil discussion are generally those who are already marginal, who already have trouble being heard, okay? Finally, mere civility, I think, tells us to resist the temptation to achieve a tolerant society through exclusion by pushing those we believe to be uncivil or intolerant beyond the pale. But that's a constant threat, and we've constantly got to resist it. I think it's a threat that's almost impossible to resist online because of the way that algorithms actually sort us in to these like-minded communities without our even knowing it. You actually have to actively resist that, okay? As Williams knew well, unmurderous coexistence in a society of sinners with the intolerant infidel next door was no picnic. But neither was the society of saints, right? So I say two cheers for mere civility. I think we'll miss it when it's gone. Thank you. <laughs>